Uh, I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. At this stage of the game, our next guest is easily defined as one of the most versatile entertainers there is. You've seen him in films like Casualties of War, Summer of Sam, Moulin Rouge, and about a million others. But John Leguizamo is also one of the greatest one-man show performers to ever grace the stage. He's currently wow. on Broadway <laughs> with his sixth one-man show, Latin History for Morons. And you can also see him in the Paramount Network miniseries, Waco. Everybody, John Leguizamo, let's thank hear you, it. Thank you, thank you. Wow, that was a boost to my ego. Holy hell. I thought you'd like that. Yeah, I did like that. I wrote it. Usually the, usually, usually <laughs> the performer's like. not on stage with me when I do that, and they were like, he's going to be on stage with us. Like, oh, I better just really kiss his ass with this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, my ass has been kissed. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's true, though. This is your sixth one-man show. You're, yeah. you're incredible at it. Uh, let's talk about what, what makes you start a one-man show. How does it start for you? Oh, dude, I, I don't even know when it's going to happen. It just it just happens to me. I, I All of a sudden, I get, like, this impulse that I got to write this story, this idea, whatever it hits, in my, hits me in the head, and then it becomes a long process of making it work because it doesn't... It, it's great in my head, but it's not so great on the paper. And then, you know, like, years and years of doing comedy clubs across the country wow. where people hate me and they hate the show and... Because you're just workshopping it and trying to see what's funny and what's I'm the not. only comedian who's ever read from his computer in a comedy club. And people got really drunk because it was two hours long, so they were like, they had to, you know, carry most of the uh, people who were there out. You did, like, the entire show in front of a comedy club, like, reading it from the computer? <laughs> I mean, I warned them. I said, this is my process. I read from a computer. That's how I do it. It will be funny, but it will be read. I don't read like your grandmother. I read well, but yeah. Have you, ever, have you ever started writing one of these and thought about not making it a one-man show and having a full cast? Or is it always like, how do I hone this so that it can just be me on stage and I can be all, all of the characters? It, well, you know, I, it, it, it is what it's going to be. And, uh, I mean, I, I, I try to make it like a play with other people, but it doesn't yes, end I mean, up... there are other characters that, you're, yeah, that yeah. you're playing. I'm wondering if it's ever been like you've created too many and you don't know how you're going to sort of straddle all of them. No, because or... I, I wanted to do this one as a play like with real characters and real people, but, th but then you lose sort of the, uh, the personal connection with the audience in terms of, I can really put a lot of political, social commentary, and I can leave it as, as commentary. I don't have to hide it in dialogue or in characters. I can just be straight up front with the audience and they know what I feel about everything. And, and I think that's what creates a real dialogue with the audience. As, I'm as authentic as I can be in front of this audience. You're also dropping new stuff in the show. I just saw it Tuesday night, and there's definitely new references oh, yeah. in there than when you started the show a couple years ago. You got shithole countries in there, which every which had a massive applause from the audience. Yeah. Or actually, I think it was a massive boo from the audience. Well, it, a, lot, a large part of my audience comes from those shithole countries. Yeah. So they responded, as I did when I heard it myself. Take me through um, the, the process of putting together this show. You said it takes a couple years and you're doing comedy clubs. Because I think when someone sits to watch it, one of the great parts of being a performer is that you make it feel natural and you right. make it feel spontaneous, even though you've been doing this every night and you've been working. Even though it, it hurts the years. shit out of me. It hurts the shit out of you. Why oh is that? Oh, my God. The show kills me. My vocal cords are fried. My body is, like, in pain. Dancing at my age is not an easy feat. I know people are going, oh, John just being himself. No, John does not dance like that anymore. Only when there's true. a thousand people. You do people. dance a lot in the play. I have to. I talk so much, I got to be quiet at some moment. And when I'm dancing, I don't talk as much. So what is what? So it's like a two-year-long process for you. How do you know when the idea... Four-year-long four year. Yeah, Don't shorten my process. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the great one-man show performers. How's that? I'll just go back to that every time I screw up. <laughs> Look, I'm not judging you here, man. I'm not here to judge you. Uh, but t take me through, wh when do you know that this That's idea ready? that you started with is going to be good enough to be a whole show? Show number 300. <laughs> Seriously, when I get to th my 300th show, I know that the thing has gelled. It just has gelled. It and always that, does. That's as a three, 300th show where you have the whole idea fleshed out and you're actually performing, not like on the comedy club stage. This no, is like it, you're in including the, the comedy club oh, okay. circuit, including everything. My 300th show... Because I've done it six times. Now I know when I hit my 300 show, I'm in, I'm on, I'm in stride. The, the characters come together. The theme makes sense. People are happy, walking out happy instead of hostile. <laughs> I had hostile people. And the first day I performed it in Buffalo, I oh, thought it was Buffalo. so... Yeah, obviously, I'm Buffalo. <laughs> You're right. What was I thinking? Why did I take it so seriously? 
But I had so much history, and I was like, oh, my God, people are going to love this history. I'm talking about, you know, World War I, the Aztec empires. I'm talking about uh, Simon Bolivar and Jose Martí, all these great Latin heroes. And the audience was like, this, this is a lot of information. I thought you were going to make us laugh. I, and, you know, then they had to drag them out. <laughs> There, um, obviously, there's a lot of history. It's called Latin History Mornings. I, I personally loved all of the history of the. Of but it's the not as much history as when I had in Buffalo. There was a lot. Really? Was, oh my God! There was so much history back then. Did you have the kind of um, the framework of talking about your family? And yeah, yeah. But, that, but they were less. Well? But it was less about my personal life. It was less. But then I realized people cannot stomach the history unless there's an equivalent experience in my life. Right that makes it analogous and helps them understand it. God, that must have been, was that painful to have to learn in that moment? A little bit, I'm not gonna lie. I was like, oh man, they don't like the history. Oh snap. Like, That's my whole play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, oh, well, I get it, I get it. They want, they want, they want they, it, they're not gonna like it. And that's the reason I went to the comedy clubs. I wanted the history to be as accessible to everyone. Right. And that, that was my point. So that was the comedy club sort of smackdown personal smackdown for myself was like, I want this history to be very accessible. I don't want it just to be for people who kind of already know it. Were you already working with your director at that time as well? No, no. He came in about a year later. Right. When you first started staging it, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Tony Tacconi, who's incredible. Right now he's doing uh, Angels in America because he was the original director of it. And so he's a brilliant dude. And, and, I, and I've seen his work before. And I wanted, I wanted this guy. I knew he could help me hone my idea. So when, you, uh, when you're performing this in front of comedy clubs, when is the moment that you decide you're ready to take it to a stage, like an actual stage? Because you didn't start on Broadway. Were you at the public first? Excuse no, me. no, I was, I, 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 my process is long, man. I was at La Jolla. My, my first theater was La Jolla Playhouse in San Diego. And then I went to Berkeley for five months, Berkeley Rep Theater. Then I was at the public for five months. And then Broadway. And then, and then Broadway. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I felt like I, I, I got all I could at the comedy club. They weren't going to let me get deeper and emotional in a comedy club. They just, it's just not built right. for that, you know? And it would, the show was getting longer, too. It's like, you, nobody does, like, three-hour comedy shows in a comedy club. Right. A comedy club is made for jokes. I mean, you can do yeah. a little bit of introspective But now they don't, but... they don't really want to hear a lot of, lot, of, lot of history, and they don't want to hear a lot of, you know, de per sad shit. They don't want to hear sad shit. And uh, I wanted to put sad shit in there. And so I left the comedy clubs, and I went to the theater, where they loved the sad shit. And they love the history. And so that's where I got my, my play. That's where it became a play. How do you balance telling uh, stories about your personal life and your family and making them funny? And, and I imagine you have to exaggerate a little bit to, tell mm. to have good jokes in there. Or tone it down a little bit. Or even, <laughs> I guess, maybe even tone it down very much. Like, have they seen it? What do they, what do they think oh, of I your waited impressions three years. of them? I waited three years till my family saw it because it was a lot of personal, personal stuff that I didn't feel I completely owned. I thought my family, it was their story, so they had to own it, and I did it. That's why I did it in the West Coast, wow. so they didn't have access to it. And uh, I wanted it to be perfect when they saw it so that they wouldn't feel offended by it or hurt by it or it would be detrimental to them in any kind of way because my family is everything to me. So, um, yeah, so I waited, and then they finally saw it at the public theater, and, I, and my son loved it and my daughter and my wife, and... And they gave me the, the approval. Otherwise, I would have just quit the show. I would have I would have stopped it. Your son is in seventh grade in the in the play, sixth or seventh, seventh, seventh Se and eighth. Yeah. And he's is he like in like ninth or tenth grade now? Since you've been he's working in, for three he's, years. He's in eleventh grade. He's in he's in eleventh yeah. grade. So he's now reflecting back on this time that you're talking about. Yeah. Like hopefully it's in this past, ago. and hopefully it's we you know we we want to move away from that. I mean that that that's my goal. You know, to oh, get yeah. to, to get to my son in a great place in life and and feeling you know. Want it because you know it's it it's crazy. I mean, the the genesis of the show is my son was bullied at school because of you know ethnicity. You know, you think it's the modern world. You're in New York. How can people? But they're still doing it. But what had happened was it it woke up all the stuff that happened to me as a kid, being picked on all the time. You're playing stickball with your friends and you beat them, and all of a sudden you know you're you're the spick. Get out of my country. And you're like, oh, yo, what happened? I thought we were friends. You know, all of a sudden, a mother. And you realize, oh, wow, they see me as other. I didn't realize, I didn't see myself as other. But now I know for sure. And then, and then I started, like, analyzing all the history I was reading. I go, wow, if, if our Latin contributions were in history textbooks, they wouldn't say things like that, like, get out of my country. I mean, 
Because Latin people are the second oldest ethnic group in America after Native Americans. We're the only ethnic group that has fought in every single war America has ever had, and we're the most decorated minority in every single war. And I'm talking about the American Revolution. I'm talking about French-Indian-American War. I know it doesn't say Latin in it, but we were there. And War of 1812, I know everybody hates that stupid war, but we were there too. 1860s, the Civil War, every single war. And now, one of the things that you kind of talk about in the play is that getting, sort of getting all of this information didn't necessarily help you find peace with this feeling of being othered, it made you kind of even angrier, and there was another way. But in a good way, like a good anger, not an anger that you that you just like, oh, I, I hate life. No, it made me angry in a, in a good way that, wow, how, how was all this information kept from me and kept from Americans? What's, what's going on here? And it makes you like want to investigate the reasons why Latin history is being banned in, in uh, Arizona, why in some yeah, people's history of the United States is being banned in, in, in other states in, in a couple states. The book, well. the book, the book. I was yeah, talking about Latin me. history. Latin yeah. history entirely is being yes, it's being banned in Arizona. Teachers in some parts of Texas are only allowed to teach Latin history one day of the year. And then, yes, the Howard Zinn's amazing book of people's history of the United States is they're trying to ban it, I think, is in either yeah, Kansas, it yeah, Kansas, yeah, or Arkansas, yeah. one of those places Probably that, that, that we don't really want to go to. <laughs> Any place that's banning Howard Zinn's book is not a place I want to visit. I mean, yeah. you're not getting my money. They're, wait, they're banning Latin history in Arizona? Like, yeah. It, and they're trying to keep it out of textbooks in, in Texas and black history with, with things like, oh, we can't really teach slavery because the kids are so young and vulnerable and it's too harsh a subject matter. Yeah, yeah, I'll slap you across the face. <laughs> it's BS. It's bullshit. Come on. I'm sorry, I'm shocked. I'm going to need a second here to recover. That's Yo, insane. that's how I felt reading all about Latin history. You're like, oh my God, wait a minute, what? We had 10,000 unknown Latino patriots in the, the American Revolution. We helped finance the, the, uh, the, uh, the American Revolution. Cuban women in Virginia sold their jewelry, the hoop earrings and door knockers, to feed the patriots. And, and General... Latin General Bernardo Galvez gave $70,000 worth of weapons to George Washington. So we too are the sons and daughters of the American Revolution. You never hear that. Then you wouldn't hear these senators like uh, uh, Steve King of Iowa or, or, or Tom Tillis of North Carolina, Carolina saying that Latin, Hispanics and blacks are not traditional Americans. You would never hear that if our history, Latin and black history, were put back into history textbooks. It's one of those things that... Uh, now I'm getting angry. Now, I mean, and now we're hearing Come it. at me. Well, it's one of those things that you think about... You no, I love my white liberals. I never get angry at you. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm pretty liberal. Pretty liberal. And you're very white. I'm very white. Very white. So you fill in both categories. Yeah. When you, when you do your, 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 your census, do you put white liberal? Uh, I, you know, I used to. I don't think I'm going to do that anymore, though. Why? Yo, to, don't be ashamed to... of liberal. Liberal is a beautiful thing, man. No, I love being liberal, but oh. I'm, I'm, I think eventually we're all going to have to hide that a little bit more when the, when the, when the administration really goes for it. Oh, wow. Yeah, you got Twitter that feed. feeling, too. We're all scared of it. Oh, yeah. They're going to start going through our Twitter feeds when we're getting on planes and stuff. I'm, I'm very nervous I've already about been that. hacked a few times. You have? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, got a, I got a message from Instagram saying that some of our celebrities have been hacked. Their information they've, they've, has been compromised. My emails, I guess, my passwords. And then Twitter, the same thing. I mean, I had all these, like, hate tweets on Twitter before the election. And you couldn't really tell what they were. They, were, they had weird logos. They had, like, one follower or none. And they would say, like, weird, hateful stuff that didn't make quite sense. You know, it was kind of weird, kind of like a foreign yeah, like bot. <laughs> like, suck you. And I go, yeah. okay, you mean you suck. Okay, whatever, it's cool. <laughs> And then the day after the election, I lost 100,000 followers, and they were all these bots. Right. And all the hate tweets disappeared that day. But now they're coming back again, these weird, like, eagle logos. They're just bizarre cartoon logos with no followers but a lot of hateful stuff that doesn't make real sense. Take me back to when you did your first show, your first one-man show. What, 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 we, 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 you're, you're segueing? I'm, I'm segueing. Okay. Because <laughs> I'm curious, because I want to I'm trying to stay know. with you. I'm like, okay, all right. Sorry, I'm throwing you around a little bit. Throwing you around a little bit because I, cool. I, I'm curious. You were already acting. You were already in. You know what was your first movie was really Casualties, Casualties of War, right? Basically, it was Casualties of War. I was 24 years old. It was like 1988. And the Paul and the Paul Morrissey film that you you had like a small part in. As, oh yeah, as well, right? that might have been my first. That was Alphabet it's, City. It's I was, a great I was, movie. I didn't have a small part. I was an extra. 
I wasn't. I wasn't even an extra. I was a background. And you got, you know, you, I, you hung out in the background. And I go, oh, wow, this is fun it's and weird. <laughs> I'm an actor. Nobody but, will know it, but I did. But your first one-man show was like 1990, right? Yeah, 1990, Mambo Mouth. And what made you want to do a one-man show? How did, that, how did that happen? Well, it was an obvious, obvious evolution. I mean, you know, here I was wanting to be an actor and, and studying with some great acting teachers, Lee Strasberg and Herbert Berghoff and Wynn Hanman and... Uh, you know, I had all my friends, and, and, and I'm going to auditions, and my white friends are going to five auditions a day, and I'm going to one every few months. And I'm like, wait a minute. I study with great acting teachers. I worked hard. I was as good at them in acting class. Why don't I have the same opportunities? It was just, it dawned on me, oh, wow, it's going to be different for me in, in this Hollywood. And uh, I started writing, and I was like, I'm not going to let this system crush me. I'm going to write my stuff. I never see Latin people anywhere. We're like invisible. So I started writing my stuff and doing it in, in downtown performance art spaces. And then I, all of a sudden I had these seven characters. And then all of a sudden um, I was put in a hallway of a theater, the American Place Theater. Because they didn't know if, Latin, if anybody wanted to hear about Latin stories. So I wasn't even in the theater. I was in the hallway on a platform like this. Oh, shit, I'm having flashbacks. <laughs> oh, my God. And like 70 people in fold-up fold chairs like that. And I had to be done before the real show in the main stage at 8 o'clock. And then, boom, all of a sudden, there was Sam Shepard in the house. Arthur Miller was in my house. Al Pacino. Holy shit. And what did Shepard say when, you, when, 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 you, when he came to see it? Well, I didn't really let him talk because I was so excited that he was there. I was like, thank you for coming. I'm, I'm just so glad you made it here. <laughs> oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you're here. I couldn't, I couldn't stop talking. I was just too, too jazzed up about, about the situation. And that's sort of, and that's 19, 1990, so you, you were also about to work with Al Pacino, right? In Carlitos. Work. Yeah, three years later. Yeah, it was yeah. crazy. And did he remember you from Mamba Mouth? Had he, did he remember Yeah, he kind of remember. Yeah, yeah. He's got a good memory, yeah. That's, I mean, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> oh, it was, dude, to work with Pacino, one of the great acting heroes of any actor, it was, was amazing. And working with him in, in Carlito's way, he, there's, he's the only actor I ever worked with who is so on his game, man. Like, whatever you throw him, he just jumps with you and he just goes with it. It's incredible. I've never seen such commitment and, and looseness and freedom. And so when you started doing Mambo Mouth, I mean, obviously that's a learning experience of learning how, what the process is for developing a show. Right. Did you have any experience with that before? Did you talk to anybody? Did you, how did, did you just figure it out on your feet? A, a kind of it. And, and, you know, I had a lot of great mentors. I mean, there was Whoopi Goldberg with her brilliant show. Right. Eric Bogosian brought the anger and the sex to it. Lily Tomlin brought sort of the play. So I just took a little bit Spalding, of everybody. You mentioned Spalding, Spalding Gray. Of course. Yeah. He was the first guy to talk personally about his life, and Richard Pryor. And I just created my own hybrid. You know, I pioneered this sort of uh, autobiographical play. So that was my contribution to the one-man show. And uh, so that, that was the beginnings of it. And I didn't know if it was going to work. I, I, I just thought, it wasn't that my, my life story was so fascinating. It was just that I thought I could tell in a really interesting way, that I, that I, that I, that I was a funny dude and I could tell in a, in a more interesting way. And, and the fact that no Latin stories were out there I knew I was hungry to hear Latin stories, so I knew there were people out there. And uh, it was right after Mambo Mouth came out on HBO that all of a sudden my next show was full of Latin people, and it was incredible, man. Wherever I went, it was like across the country. We had found each other, you know what I mean? The, uh, my Latin audience and myself, and together, boom, we became sort of this marriage. When you say your next show, do you mean your next show is in Mambo Mouth? Or no, the next Rama. show? Oh, Spe Rama. Yes. It was banned in Texas because of the title, and the, although they're super racist over there, but they, they don't want to use the word, though. Right, that's why it was banned, the title. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying it was probably banned because they're just racist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, you got it, great. Well, they use different words over there. They use beaners more than... than, than. That's awful, that's awesome. <laughs> I thought you had another one after, after beaners. <laughs> oh, no, they have a lot of stuff. I'm not going to go through the whole litany of like what they call us, I mean. So when you get to something like Latin history <laughs> Not for this morals, early in the day. <laughs> when, I need a few more hours before, maybe a few drinks. When is, when, when is the moment, after having done five shows before this, when is the moment where you decide that, okay, this is an idea that I'm going to spend three, four years for dedicating one, for, my, for Latin history? After having done it five times. Right. Knowing the amount of I never of thought I was going to do in. five of them. I mean, my plan was never to be just a one-man show kind of guy, but... This one really hit me, man. This one, I, I, I just figured out some things. I just was like, wait a minute. 
the reason I got bullied, my son got bullied, the reason I found all these stats, Latin stats, like that we have the highest drop, high school dropout rate of any minority in America, they were the most bullied ethnic group in the workplace in America, that were the largest ethnic group in jails now because of immigration detention, that hate crimes are up with us because of, you know, what things are being said at the administration. And I go, what's, what's similar with all this? And I was like, I know what it is. It's our Latin history that's not out there in textbooks and it's not acknowledged. And without that, how do you get people to respect you? We wouldn't be as vulnerable to what the administration does or says to us if our history was in textbooks. Our, and we help make America. So why isn't it there? It's not like I'm asking for things that are far-fetched and, and bizarre. I'm asking for just legitimate things that, that we contributed to this country. And it's so crazy. You, you think there's a kind of innocence to leaving it out of textbooks in the last, like, 70 years, or, like, you know, in the 1800s or in the 1900s. Right, right. Because you just think of racism as, like, yeah, they yeah, were that racist, was then, that yeah. was just back then. But then to hear that someone is actively trying to keep it out of history books now, I, how do you even... How, how I know, you I know. It's, it's crazy. It's, yeah. But it's, it's all a power grab. I mean, it's a power grab. Back in the 1830s, it was to keep Latin people from feeling empowered because most of the Latin people were living all in the, in the West Southwest and they've been there forever because they were all part indigenous and and so they've been there hundreds and thousands of years. And it's still and how, very much that. It's right, still very, exactly. Yeah. So how do you take away their land and their things but you don't include their history? You, 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 you take them out of... Because a lot of them were mayors and governors when they helped turn Texas to from Mexico to, to America. They were mayors and governors and they let them do that while they helped fight against Mexico and then... They wanted their land, and they didn't want them in power, and then they, you know, started lynching Latin people. And since 1830 to 1930, 600 Latin people have been lynched in the Southwest. Yeah. And now it's about taking away their agency so that they don't vote and so that they don't participate in the sort of marketplace in the way that is competitive with Go on, my brother. white population. Tell it. Preach. I mean, that's what preach. it is. Yeah. Word. Word up. If it's not taking away land, it's, he gets it's me taking riled away up. vote. He gets me riled up. <laughs> the Latin population is yes, the most my brother. growing Run for population in this country. Your ass. Because I'm white. Because I'm a white liberal. <laughs> hey, you know, us black people and Latin people, we, we got to stand up for ourselves, but we can't do it completely alone. We need the white liberal. That's the person that helps us solidify our causes and helps us fight against, you know, administrations like this one. Yeah. So I got much love for the white liberal. Thank you. Uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Who has a question? Hi, John. Hey, I'm looking exactly. forward to watching your show on Broadway. Um, you mentioned earlier working with Al Pacino um, on Kalita's Way. I uh, just want to touch upon that. Um, I was reading that you kind of mentioned that movie when you were directed by Brian De Palma really defined your kind of acting style. Yeah, yeah, true that. Um, so I was wondering. Done his research. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was wondering two things. Um, what was it about that movie? Because you'd worked with Brian. Yeah. The part we did before. Yeah, yeah, was yeah. about that movie that kind of helped you define the style. And also, when you, if, when you look at the work you do on stage, have you have a have you had a similar experience working with a stage director or a specific play that gave you that same acting style for the stage? Oh, that's interesting. That you got like three, four questions <laughs> in your one question. Yeah, you know this is my show, right? <laughs> <laughs> he upstaged your ass big time. We're gonna have to do give, something give him about your this mic. guy. <laughs> you better hang your mic, bro. Right here, guys. Get him out of here. Sorry. There'll be no upstaging of me. I'll be the best speaker. I speak, I have the big words, all the big words. Um, well, I, I, what happened to me in, in, in Carlito's way was I had worked with De Palma. So this is my second time with him. So I feel much more comfortable and he trusted me, which is why people work with the same director often because you, you, you create this rapport and, and you have a shorthand. And, and I did a lot of research for the part you know, and, and I knew people like that growing up. Uh, I mean, drug dealers. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they let me go, you know, and I started improvising like crazy and, and adding all this text, and, 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 and De Palma loved it. And so I, I felt like I really found myself, like what it was to be present in the moment, to be as, 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 as explosive and as volatile as you can be and also as quiet and working with Pacino was, was, and Sean Penn was ridiculous. So that's, that's what, how I found myself in there. And then I followed up with Tu Wong Fu where I did the same thing again, you know, sort of like I did mad research, hung out with all these transgender uh, Latin uh, w women and men. And, uh, and they helped me, you know, helped me find this character and helped define it and helped create this whole life. And then I brought it 
to to Wang Fu, and 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 they, and and uh, B Bang Kidron allowed me to bring all this extra stuff to it. By the way, they're turning Tu Wang Fu into a musical, That's right. Broadway musical. Can't wait to see that shit. Yeah. Are there, it's gonna be off the hook. Are there who are who are some other directors that you've worked with on multiple occasions? Are there are there other? Oh yeah, other a lot. Diploma? Yeah, I work with the late great Tony Scott twice, right. and Spike Lee. I worked with him a few times. He directed Freak. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did... Oh, that's uh, right. I forgot that he... Did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did uh, Summer of Sam, which he calls his white exploitation film. I love Summer of Sam. <laughs> no, oh, it's a classic, man. It's a, it's a, it's a wild movie. It's also wild. Spike Lee on, like, doing as much as he can as a director. He's like, I'm going to throw everything at the wall. Throw it all, fits. baby. He, he, that was the first time I went to Cannes Film Festival. Oh, wow. It was so exciting because I'd never been there, you know, and then, you know, you heard all about it your whole life. Like, this is what you make it. It's, it was like Mecca. And you go out there and, you know, everybody, oh, c'est très bon, ton, ton travail, c'est formidable en plus, oh, ouais. I remember there's that great scene of you and, is it with B.B. Newworth in the, in the barbershop? Oh, you got whoa. those, like, like, little tight underwear on. <laughs> Don't do that when you're talking so, about <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Uh, but there's that, there's, there's the two things that I remember most from that is that and Adrian Brody's Bob O'Reilly, like, music video. Oh, that out was of so nowhere. dope. It's so wild. They were, I mean, Spike went for it, man. Yeah. And Spike just doesn't hold anything back. I mean, he's an a actor's director. He just makes the environment so safe and so free. You can do anything. You feel like you can do anything. You feel like you're invincible. And you see him at the, at, at, at the, at the camera when you're done with the scene going, he gets so excited when stuff hits. And then you feel like, oh man, I just want to work, go to work every day and just be as free as possible. It's so crazy, how does he do that? Well, at the same time, he's filming so beautifully and capturing these scenes in such a cinematic way. That's why he's a master. Know. Yeah. Because he does. I mean, his shots, I mean, he hires the best DPs in the world. He's got an incredible eye. He knows what the energy he's looking for, you know? And he's looking for sort of like actors to be as free as possible. He's looking. We're all craving that. But it's, 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 it's hard to, to offer yourself up like that if you feel vulnerable or you feel like you're going to be put down. You know, it's like Nick Nolte said it the it. best way. He said, our, our talent, Nick Nolte said to a director who was giving him line readings, he said, my talent is like this feather. I don't know where he got the feather, but he had a feather. And, it, <laughs> and, and he went, my talent's like this, <sighs> gone. If you don't, if you're not safe and you're not comfortable, there's, you can't be free. You can't, your talent goes away. How, have you found yourself in situations like that where it felt like someone blew the feather away? I don't I want knew to I shouldn't have said that because he no. was going to... Yeah, of course I, I found specific. myself. I don't good, want a specific good, good. thing. I don't want to yeah. go into that. But I'm, I'm curious... All what, right, Steven what... Seagal. <laughs> no. Oh, that's right. There was this Seagal <laughs> story from your book, right? Yeah, right? And your, yeah. I already your talked show. about it, yeah. But yeah, no, I've had lots of experiences that were really negative and, and, and you know, you want to quit, you want to be fired, you want to do anything to get the hell out of that situation because... You know, you know, I love what I do. I'm not in there for the cash or the fame. I was in it to, to be a great artist. And when they, they're squashing my talent, I just, it, makes you, it makes it impossible. I think we have time for one more question. Just one more. It better be really good, because it's one more. Hi, John. How hey, are how are you? I want to thank you for shedding light um, on the fact that they are trying to remove Latin history out of schools. I wanted to ask you, um, what are you doing to advocate to push Latin history uh, being continued in schools, and what can we do to continue to advocate to push Latin history back into schools? Well, that, that's a great question, because, you know, the, in these times, these sort of dark times, we can't be passive, and we can't take a back seat, and we can't let somebody else do it for us. We all got to do it, you know, and we all got to do everything I can. I, I've been trying to get very politicized. Um, one thing I'm going to do when I go on tour with this show is have reg uh, voter registration in my theater, to register people for the midterms election because I feel like the midterm election is the most important election of all of our lives. Fuck yeah. Yes. And we have to flip these seats and flip them blue so that, they, so that our needs are met. And I'm talking about all of us and I'm talking about people of color, I'm talking about white liberals, I'm talking about decent human beings doing decent things and, and to, to make this country great because this country is about inclusivity. So I'm doing that. I've had a lot of political people come to see the show, you know, and teachers who are, took notes and, and then asked me for the syllabus so that they can change some of the, you know, what they're doing in school. Cause, because what I've, I've learned, I know a lot of the curriculum is controlled and the textbooks are made in Texas, but teachers have found, hopefully I'm not gonna blow the, up this spot, is that they used it, the, the, the digital age has allowed them to go on the internet and they can include things into their, 
lesson plan that's not maybe in the textbook or allowed, but they can include a lot of Latin history and black history into their curriculums that way. Have you thought about uh, putting together a version of the show that is uh, like um, accessible to, to children? Yes, that has I'm trying to work look? on it, man. I'm trying to figure out, you know, how to do it. Yeah, like do like a textbook uh, for, for, so that they can, people could use it a, a, as a textbook, you know. I mean, I mean, it won't be a legit textbook because it has to go through, the, through, through Texas, but so you're gonna take it'll, this be, it'll be a, an illegal Latin history textbook. <laughs> so you're going to ta so take the show on tour? Yes. When do, when does the tour start? Starts at in, I think in May. How many shows? What do you mean? How many how many cities are you going to? How many shows are you doing? Uh, well, California, Chicago, Texas, Florida. That might be it. I try to do a few more. That's amazing. So you're going to be you're, this show is going to have been with you for going on five, five yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you find the time to shoot? I, I know I have to let you go, but I think I was told that we have to talk about Waco a little we bit. We got to talk about Waco is the bomb, man. Yeah. Uh, it's fantastic. I, I've I've seen the I've seen the first few episodes. That's uh, the ones I'm in. Yes, yeah, and uh, <laughs> you're you not to watch anymore. You're in that amazing. <laughs> I'm not in anymore. You're in that amazing wedding sequence where Taylor oh Kitch is playing the guitar. <laughs> he looks so hilarious with the guitar. It is the most the awkward wedding. dancing I've ever done in my life. Yeah, you hate dancing, as you said at the beginning. Oh, yeah, my of the dancing is my, you know, it's in my blood. So I, I, I was like, now, but I have to be an awkward cop dancer, <laughs> FBI dancer. Where so are I was you? Think, I was looking at all the white people dancing, just trying to memorize their moves, <laughs> unbeknownst to them, and I'm like, <laughs> and I was trying to like find all the best moves because I, I can't, I couldn't figure out how to do that. <laughs> how did you uh, How did you find the time to do Waco in the midst of putting together this show? Well, they came with this amazing concept, man. Brilliant script, miniseries, and, and the role was phenomenal. It was based on a real guy, and uh, a real FBI guy, and uh, who we couldn't use his real name because he had, there was a bit major lawsuit with him for the for the for the uh, uh, during the event. Uh, the Waco Waco is about. Uh, does everybody know what it's about? This cult in the '90s that you know, was selling arms, <laughs> which is illegal. And uh, the FBI found out, you know, that there might be some, you know, some sexual uh, misconduct. And, uh, and they came at them. And uh, they became, it became a big firefight. Came and at them hard. <laughs> very hard. A little too hard, perhaps. And, and there was a big shootout, and, and a lot of people lost their lives. Yeah. But it's, it's great because it gets into the head of, of a cult and what happens, how these people get seduced by a great charismatic leader like Taylor Kitsch. An incredible cast all around. Oh, too. wow. I mean, Michael Shannon. Shea F Wiggum, was incredible. You. F the best FBI actor in the, in the history. <laughs> he, he plays the best FBI guys ever. You Michael Shannon? Yeah. Yeah. And then Taylor Kitsch as, as David uh, Koresh. Paul Sparks, right? In oh, there he's as well. amazing, man. What a great actor. He's an, Andrew he's... Riseborough, who plays. Oh, that's right. Because David Koresh got all the men to stop having sex because it was against the Bible, but he was going to keep having sex with all their wives. How clever is that shit? I would have figured that out too. You, oh, you can't have sex with them because it's really dirty and disgusting, but I'm going to do it for you. Because I have to, we have to keep growing the population. Genius. What, what kind of, were, were you? How those suckers fell for that shit. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> that doesn't sound quite right. Said they're like, absolutely, sounds great. Let's do it. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, take it. Yeah. Uh, what kind of were you able to do any research going into going into this, or is this one of those situations where the the writer and the director have really kind of done all the research, and you just have to sort of show up and do? Well, and you always got to do extra research. I don't think you can go show show up and not do your own research. No, they did incredible amounts, and they gave me a lot of it too. They passed it on. There was a lot of stuff on YouTube to watch. Uh, you know, obviously, I couldn't talk to the the the, the real guy. My character is called Jacob Vargas in the show. But the real guy is Robert Rodriguez, and I had to, like, find him, you know, he wouldn't talk to me, so I could only find his interviews that he did at the time before he wasn't allowed to talk about it anymore. And he, he ended up suing the, the FBI? Yes. Wow. And he won. Wow. Because of the excessive use of force or because they put him in peril? Because they fired him unjustly because he had uncovered a lot of information and, and uh, yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. I remember now where the show, excuse me, where it was going last time, last time I saw it. It's, it's deep. It's really well researched, man. It's, it's, it's a truth. Yeah. At this, at this, at this point in your career, like uh, when you can go and do one man shows and tour with it and work on a show for five years, how selective are you when it comes to projects in regards to TV and movies? Are you kind of like, no, I've got my own thing. I don't really <laughs> need to do 
all this stuff. Something like Waco comes along. Oh, yeah, yeah. it was an amazing opportunity, you know. And, and any chance I get the chance to have a positive Latin role model out there, you know, I, I jump for joy, you know, instead of being sort of, you know, continuing uh, <laughs> the negativity out there. Was that hard to be able to, I mean, is that getting easier to do, does it feel like, with the stories that are being told, rather than, like, in the 80s and early 90s? Oh, definitely, it's a lot better. I mean, we made... We haven't made as much progress on film, unfortunately. We're the least represented minority on film, less than 3%, even though we were outsized moviegoers. Like, we, 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 we're like 23% of the moviegoer uh, uh, box office. Yeah, I mean, the movies have not improved as much. I mean, they could, but TV has. I mean, you have America for Hour and Superstore. You have J-Lo, the lead, female leads in their TV shows. And uh, Gina Rodriguez and Jane the Virgin. So that's, that's amazing, man. That's incredible. Um, John, but not I'm, in film. But the, not the in film. Film needs to improve and fix. You know, they, first of all, they got to tell stories that are about us, with us, and you know, like this Black Panther thing is so exciting for me. I mean, just to, you know, I heard somebody uh, the other day we were doing. I was doing a Q and A for Latin History of Morons, and the, and this mom said that her son said, "Look, black people can be superheroes too." See, the, the, her son was like flabbergasted that, you know, you, if you see yourself represented positively, imagine what it does to the youth. I mean, look, I that's just, something that it's going to make me cry. Yeah, That's something that you say yeah. really at the beginning of the play as well, is that if you see yourself represented, you don't feel invisible right. anymore. Right, right. And also you don't, you, you don't feel, you, it undoes the negative messaging that's out there constantly, you know? Yeah. How do you project yourself into the future positively if you haven't seen yourself positively represented? How do you do that? How, who does that math? Who can do that? You know, I did it because I had all these mentors. You know, you can't come from the hood and not have somebody tap you on the shoulder and go, you're worthwhile, you're worth it. Go for your dreams. You need that. You can't do it by yourself. Um, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm getting, um, I'm getting the rap sign. I feel like I keep talking for a little while. What does the rap sign look like? It's, oh, it was her right there. <laughs> She's like... Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, Latin History for Morons is on Broadway right now at Studio 54. It'll be up for how, how much? Two more weeks, Two more baby. Weeks go. And then I'm history. It's amazing. Well, then you'll be across Literally. the country. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. True that, true that. Waco is on, is on the Paramount Network right now. Yeah, people when you find it, check where it do out. you find it? People, you, you, have, is there people, you found it easy, right? Yeah. All right, yeah. good, good. Yeah. Everybody, John Leguizamo, let's yeah, hear it. Thank you.